Welcome everyone to the History of Diving Museum's February Immerse Yourself. I'd like to thank everyone who is watching at home on Zoom, uh, our guests in the library, and people who will be watching this presentation on YouTube after the fact. I'd also like to thank this month's sponsor, which is Easy Storage. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our upcoming events. So uh, in April, we are, I'm sorry, uh, in March next month, March 29th, we are going to have Dive Into Art and Music, which is a musical event with, fu with food, music, dancing, art raffles of Jerry Garcia's um, print collection as well. So be sure to check out our website for more information about that. Coming up in May, May 4th and 5th, we are going to have our uh, vintage dive weekend. So we're going to have people going out on the water in vintage gear, double hose regulators. Uh, it's going to be a really fun events. So be sure to mark your calendars and subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already to get updates on that. Um, dive into Art Coral Creations is open now until April 17th, which is our limited time featured exhibit featuring artwork from the Art Guild of the Purple Isles, as well as many local schools, and it's all with the theme of coral conservation. That is going to be here at the museum until April 17th, so be sure to come in and see that if you haven't already. Uh, next month's Immerse Yourself is going to be a presentation with Florida Atlantic University Research Fellow, Dr. Chelsea Bennis, who's going to talk about um, octopus behavior and biology. She is a marine biologist and an octopus expert who does research down here in the Keys and in the, the greater South Florida area. It's going to be very interesting, so be sure to come here next month for that Immerse Yourself. For tonight, we have David St. Pierre, who is uh, broadcasting from Canada. He's going to be talking about the Empress of Ireland, which uh, was an ocean liner that met a tragic fate in 1914 off the coast of Canada in the St. Lawrence River. And I will let David take it away from here. So thank you everyone for joining us and I'll pass it off to you, David. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the introduction. I'll just uh, make sure that everybody sees my presentation here. I'll be sharing my screen. Um, go. So I hope it works and everyone sees it. And without further ado, I'll be starting. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the Empress of Ireland. Um, what I've um, prepared as a presentation tonight will be divided in two main blocks and two main sections. The first one being sort of an introduction to the story of the Empress of Ireland, because um, it's, it's always um, referred to as the forgotten Empress and uh, people seem to uh, uh, put a lot of interest on the Titanic and we know why and we understand why, but uh, somehow other ocean liners that met tragic uh, fates are um, somewhat forgotten and the Empress of Ireland is one of them. So I'll be doing an introduction to the story of the Empress and the second section will be mainly focusing on uh, the after math of the sinking and the um, salvage and diving operations that were conducted on the wreck of the Empress of Ireland in the summer of 1914. So let's begin. The Canadian Pacific Railway um, was well known at the end of the, of the uh, 19th century, the 1800s, for of course, it's railway and the railway line, but it was also known as a, a transportation network, especially on the Pacific. Um, at the turn of the century, uh, the early 1900s, the Canadian Pacific Railway had um, an important steamship line on the Pacific Ocean. So it was already well established there with the uh, white Empress ships the Empress of Japan, the Empress of China, the Empress of India. And uh, the CPR already had a hotel network and, of course, an extensive rail network. But the goal of the company at the time was to become one of the world's main 
transportation system and the main missing link to to, um, to achieve that goal was to establish a steamship line on the North Atlantic. <clears throat> so the main, um, the first, I would say, step that the CPR took to establish itself on the uh, North Atlantic was to buy the Elder Dempster Company's Beaver Line of, of older steamship in 1903. But the idea of the CPR by buying these ships was mainly to buy the um, the officers and the crew members that were working on these ships, people that already knew the Atlantic trade and that were already established there. So in 1903, the CPR started the CPR Atlantic steamship line with these ships, but um, very quickly they realized that they had to order uh, brand new and, and uh, big ocean liners to re really establish themselves. And they did so in 1904 by ordering a pair of steamships uh, that became the Empress of Ireland and the Empress of Britain. So in 1904, the order was placed to the Fairfield shipyard in Glasgow, Scotland for these two steamships that would become the largest ocean liners on the Canadian trade. Now the Empress of Ireland and the Empress of Britain, the Empresses of the Atlantic, as they called them at the time, were not the largest ocean liners um, on the Atlantic, of course, but at, as I was just mentioning, on the Canadian route, they were. Uh, plying uh, the Canadian route, the Empresses of the Atlantic were the fastest steamships and the largest steamships at 14,191 gross tons. The Empresses were much larger than the largest Allen liners that uh, were already established on the Atlantic at the time. So the Empresses had 570 feet, were uh, 570 feet long, 65 feet wide, and were quite large and comfortable ships. Not the most luxurious, but comfortable ships. Um, they could carry a thousand passengers in third class, around 350 in second class, and 350 in first class. Just around 450 crew members um, were necessary to uh, manage and uh, to uh, stale the ship. In the United Kingdom, Liverpool was the port of call and was also the port of registry of the Empresses. And in North America, Quebec City was a regular port of call for the Empresses. During the summer, of course, because during the winter time, as it is now here in Montreal, the St. Lawrence River uh, at the time was uh, frozen over and closed to navigation. So the Empresses were uh, going to St. John, New Brunswick and Halifax. But Quebec City and Liverpool was the main route of these two steamships. Now, the Empress of Ireland was launched in January 1906, and she made her maiden voyage in June of 1906. And as, as I was mentioning, they were um, the Empress of Ireland was not the largest ocean liner on the Atlantic, but it was the largest ocean liner on the Canadian trade. So they became, uh, in 1906 especially, somewhat of a, a sensation on the St. Lawrence River. Um, and it was the talk of the town for the first few years. Uh, these steamships were becoming quickly the most popular ships around. Uh, people gathered on the wharves along the St. Lawrence to see the Empresses uh, sail by. And uh, in the first few years of um, their uneventful careers, the Empresses just established themselves as very, very popular ships. What you see on the screen now, and you'll see that in my presentation, I have a lot of photographs. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed with uh, history through images and history through photographs. So I, uh, I insist a lot on, on 
what we can learn through the images. Um, what you have on the screen now are a few shots of the interior of the Empress of Ireland in second and third class. On the left of the screen there is the third class smoking room. On the top of the screen is the second class dining room. And on the bottom right in color is the third class general room in the middle of which was a sand pit for the children to enjoy uh, while being rolled and rocked around on the uh, North Atlantic, I guess, <laughs> crossing over. So it was your typical ocean liner flying the North Atlantic divided in classes. Uh, we saw the second and third class. And these are a few images of the first class. Uh, on the left is a um, staircase landing. On the top are the spacious promenade deck. Um, on the bottom there, you can see a view of the first class dining room. And on your right is the first class music room with a grand piano and a true working fireplace. But when I say that the Empress of Ireland was a really popular ship, it was also popular because uh, the crew members integrated into the um, Quebec City Society for the eight years that the ship was coming into town. Um, I chose these two photos to illustrate that fact. Um, on your left, you have the Empress Juniors, uh, the, the soccer team uh, made up of crew members of the Empress, and they played in Quebec City while the ship was in port against uh, teams from Quebec City. And that's actually a photo from when they um, won the 1909 Quebec City Athletic Tournament. So you can imagine that uh, all of these people created links uh, with the population locally, and they became very well known in the port of Quebec, especially. On your right there, is um, the Piero troop, so uh, the uh, theater troop on board the Empress of Ireland, again made up of crew members. And this is the photo. It, it looks like it's a photo taken on the deck of the Empress. It's actually taken on stage in a theater in St. John, New Brunswick, because the, the theater crews uh, on board the uh, Empress of Ireland played in theaters in town. So when I say that it's a popular ship, it, 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 it also goes to that length that the crew members were integrated into Quebec uh, society at some point, and in Liverpool also. But let's focus on um, Quebec for now, because, of course, as you know, the tragedy uh, that, that came in 1914 happened in Quebec. So eight years of a career crossing from Quebec City to Liverpool, uh, pretty uneventful. And in 1914, the Empress of Ireland um, came to Quebec City to start a new summer season in May. And May 28, 1914 was actually um, just a typical departure, but, but was actually the first summer season crossing from Quebec City that year. The photos that you have on screen right now are all photos taken on May 28, 1914, the last uh, departure of the Empress of Ireland. So as I was saying, the, the, that particular crossing had nothing really special about it. A um, hundred and uh, a thousand, I'm sorry, a thousand and fifty-seven passengers uh, boarded the Empress of Ireland um, and 420 crew members were. The first class was not um, really um, booked, was not booked. Um, only 87 passengers were traveling first class for that particular crossing out of, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, 350 passenger capacity. In second class, a little more than 200 people were um, on board. And that's 
um, that's a particular event for that crossing, a very large contingent of the Canadian Salvation Army was traveling second class uh, for that particular crossing because they were going over to London for an international congress. So actually the photos that you see there were taken by a photographer hired by the Salvation Army to document uh, that particular crossing. And in the bottom of your screen there, are the two passengers that you see um, leaning on the railing of the Empress of Ireland are the number one and number two uh, commanders of the Sal Canadian Salvation Army at the time. Commander Reese, uh, number one, was uh, is a, the man with a white beard there leaning over. <clears throat> In third class, uh, 717 passengers were boarding the Empress. And it's a very broad scope of um, your typical contingent of passengers on a crossing like this. Uh, people from all over, of course, mainly Canadians and Americans going over to Europe, but also um, uh, Eastern Europeans and Scandinavians boarded the Empress that day. Uh, some of them returning to Europe only for the summer, uh, expecting to come back after a month or two. And some of them going over to reestablish themselves in Europe after uh, a failed emigration to Canada or going over to get the rest of their families over uh, to Canada with them. So in all, 1,477 people were on board the Empress on May 28, 1914, when she left Quebec City at 4.30 p.m. So um, when the ship left Quebec City at 4.30, um, she had to sail down the St. Lawrence. That's the, um, um, the map that you have in the middle shows the route that the Empress had to take from Quebec City towards Rimouski, Quebec. That's the red arrow that you see there. So the Empress had to sail down the St. Lawrence River, down to Rimouski, where uh, the Empress would pick up the mail bags because she was an RMS, so Royal Mail Ship. And she had to pick up the mail bags going over to Europe at Rimouski. And then she would um, pick up a little steam and steam down the river for another few miles and stop again off Father Point, where the lighthouse that you see there on the left is located, to drop off the river pilot that was on board the Empress uh, since Quebec City, since she left Quebec City. All of that, sailing from Quebec City and going over to Rimouski and Father Point, took about seven and a half hours, which is regular um, sailing time for that distance. Even though it's not such a, a big distance, uh, steamships do not go full speed ahead in the St. Lawrence because it's such a difficult uh, river to navigate. It's still the same today, by the way. So very clear night. The Empress stopped uh, in Rimouski and then Father Point around 1.30 a.m. to pick up the mails and drop off the pilot. When the Empress took up a little steam leaving Father Point right after that, just a few miles out, um, the crew, the, the lookouts on the Empress and the crew, some crew members spotted another steamship uh, coming upriver about eight miles away. And that's the SS Storstad uh, that you see on the right of the screen there. The Collier SS Storstad was full of coal, had left uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, and was heading up to Montreal to unload the coal uh, cargo that she had, and um, also to, to be uh, repaired because her engines were actually uh, damaged. And the route that this, the Storstad was following is the blue arrow that you have on the map there. So both ships were going to be 
crossing each other's paths quite close one another because they were both heading, first of all, to Father Point, one to drop off the pilot and one to pick up a pilot. Usually, these maneuvers around Father Point um, go without a hitch, and it's it's typical maneuvers and the, just a typical route that both ships had to follow. When the uh, Storstad was spotted from the Empress of Ireland, the weather was really clear. It was estimated that she was around eight miles away. And on the Storstad, exactly the same. The Empress of Ireland was spotted about eight miles away, very clear weather. And the ships were going to cross each other at a close distance, but a safe distance if everything went as planned. Of course, as you probably know, that's not what happened. And as soon as the two ships got closer to uh, one another, a fog bank came in from the south shore and uh, enveloped both ships, so much so that they lost sight of each other. Now, just before the fog set in, and that's where the two versions uh, from the crews of each ship's uh, defer a lot, and that's where they separate each other. Just when the fog set in on the Empress of Ireland, they had established that the Storstad would be passing the Empress on the starboard side so that the two ships would meet uh, starboard to starboard. Now on the Storstad, when they spotted the Empress, they had planned that the ship would, would be uh, crossing their paths, and that they would meet each other starboard to starboard. But just before the fog came in on the store stand, they, um, they saw that the Empress turned just so very slightly, but finally showed uh, its port side, and then the fog set in. So based on that... Um, the, the crew of the store stand in the fog expected the Empress to be passing port to port. So they expected the Empress to be on their port side. Now that, of course, is very different and very critical. And what exactly happened has never been um, established 100%, but what we think is that um, both ships had doubts as to where the other ship was. And of course, they couldn't communicate um, uh, together um, except using foghorns. There was no other means of communication between the two ships. And the foghorn signals were very difficult to uh, locate and interpret uh, in the fog. So both ships decided to stop and to try and establish the position of the other. And when the Storstad decided to stop, they, they made sure that they were dead in the water, as, as we say. But they realized that the currents were um, making them um, uh, go towards the port side. And since they thought that the Empress was on the port side, the um, officer on the bridge of the Storstad, Alfred Tuftinus, who was chief officer, the captain was sleeping at the time, uh, Alfred Tuftinus ordered the ship to pick up a little speed so that the rudder would have an effect and turn towards the starboard side to leave a little space to the Empress. Of course, the Empress was not on the port side, she was on the starboard side, and the collision occurred in fog. So around 2 a.m. the morning of May 29, 1914, the Storstad rammed the Empress of Ireland amidships, right in between the two funnels on the starboard side of the Empress, damaging the watertight bulkhead that was there and causing a tremendous um, gash in the side of the Empress, 
And you can imagine the um, the incredible amount of water that came in the Empress right away. The stores that could not remain in the side of the Empress and the two ships separated again in fog very quickly. On the Empress of Ireland, um, the crew realized everything happened very, very quickly and the ship started listing on the, to the starboard side very quickly. And the crew realized that they couldn't do much for the passengers, unfortunately, being the middle of the night and the ship listing so badly. So the ship uh, listed and finally rolled over to her starboard side and sank in only 14 minutes. And that is 14 minutes between the collision and when nothing was left on the surface of the St. Lawrence. So out of the uh, 1,477 people on board, only 465 survived. Most of them, uh, a little more than 60% of them being crew members. So 1,012 people died and uh, most of them being paying passengers. A little more uh, than 60% of the crew members survived. Why? Because it, the order to abandon ship was given very quickly. And the crew members knew the ship. They knew their way around. They knew how to get out. Um, and um, a good, a good, a number of them were on watch, were actually working and awake. So uh, they just saved themselves. Only 20% of the passengers on board the Empress survived. And that is actually um, a, a number that is so high that um, more passengers died on the Empress of Ireland than on the Titanic. So the total number of people that died on the Titanic was greater but if you only consider the number of passengers, more passengers died on the Empress of Ireland than on the Titanic. Of course, uh, the crew had time to launch a few lifeboats, uh, even though it happened so quickly. And they also had time to uh, send an SOS to Father Point. So rescue ships were sent from Father Point and Rimouski, but they couldn't do much. Um, and when the two rescue ships the uh, pilot boat Eureka and the mail boat Lady Evelyn uh, arrived to the scene uh, 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes later. Nothing could really be done. And the only thing that the two rescue ships ended up doing um, was to pick up the survivors from lifeboats and from the Storstad and bring them back to the shore. Now, in the aftermath of, of the sinking, a commission of inquiry was mandated to try and determine the causes of the sinking. Um, sometimes people um, just retain from the commission of inquiry that the store stat was to blame for the sinking. And it is true that um, the, the commission of inquiry concluded that the decisions taken on the bridge of the Storstad, uh, meaning especially to pick up a little speed and turning in the fog, led directly to the collision and then the sinking. Um, it is not true that the Commission of Inquiry uh, placed uh, absolutely no blame to the crew of the Empress. And um, um, one thing, for example, uh, was mentioned was that the uh, watertight doors in the Empress of Ireland were ordered to be closed too late to have any effect to try and save the ship. The Storstad was repaired and sold um, later on to pay for the claims um, pile, piling up at the CPR by survivors and the families of the victims. But it was a ridiculous amount. The Storstad was sold for uh, $175,000 and the total claims that were placed uh, that were that were filed to the CPR amounted to almost $3 million. 
at the time. <laughs> and very quickly after the sinking, um, people were um, organizing, especially the underwriters, the insurance companies, and the CPR, uh, organized um, salvage operations and diving operations to try and recover uh, the bodies and some valuables out of the wreck. And I'm entering now in the second part of the presentation. And I'll begin that part with a short introduction um, that I think some of you may find interesting. Um, I've been researching the story of the Empress of Ireland for almost uh, 30 years. And in, in 2016, I published a book called um, The Empress of Ireland, A History Through Images. Uh, because my main focus of research and interest has been history through photos for a long time. And um, in the fall of 2021, one of my friends, uh, Sebastien Rudon from Quebec City, called me one night and um, told me, well, I, I just saw an auction and um, there are two photos for sale. And I think you might be interested because they show the lighthouse uh, at Father Point. So I look at uh, the auction, he sent, sends me the link. And these are the two photos that you see on screen that were for sale. When I saw these photos, um, I, I, my heart skipped a beat. And I realized immediately that these two photos were showing the salvage operations being prepared uh, in the summer of 1914. Well, I knew that. Well, the first clue was how the sailors that you see on the photo on the left there are dressed. These are British sailors. And the only time when British sailors did an operation like that on the wharf in Father Point at that time was when they uh, prepared the diving operations on the Empress. <clears throat> so long story short, I contacted the um, the lady that was selling these two photographs and my attention was drawn to the backs of the photographs uh, in the auction. Because as you can see, um, they were peeled off a photo album. That's the, the traces of black paper that you see there. So I contacted the seller and uh, told her I was interested and asked her, where's the rest of the album? Are there any more photos where these two came from? And she said, well, yeah, of course, I'm, I just started dismantling the album. And my, my goal is to sell the photos individually. So I said, well, please stop doing that. And uh, can you describe the rest of the album? And um, she started describing the rest of the album. And I realized that uh, it was more than 500 photos um, of salvage operations and diving operations from 1908 to 1917. And among these 525 photos, almost 60 of them showed the salvage operations over the Empress of Ireland in the summer of 1914. So I acquired the album. Um, and, uh, and the rest is, uh, what I'm going to present right now. It, it led to, uh, my second book on the Empress that came out last summer. And, uh, for the rest of the presentation, the photos that you will see, almost all of them come from that single photo album. And almost all of them were unknown before, uh, 2021. So back to our story of the aftermath of the sinking of the Empress. Um, very early on, it was decided that salvage operations would be conducted. And um, in the St. Lawrence, a, a few salvage companies worked here and were well known. But one of them out of New York um, was well known for um, doing all of the most complicated jobs. Um, 
they had started out in the St. Lawrence with um, a few extraordinary salvage operations and ship refloatings that made the news at the time in 1907, 8, 9. And they came back to the St. Lawrence a lot of times <clears throat> during that period. They're the, they, they, were, they were called the Yankee Salvage Association. And so uh, very quickly, I think if I remember correctly, the, the first contract was awarded June 2nd. So just a, a few days after the sinking, the Yankee Salvage Association out of New York was hired to come over the Empress and to um, do a first few dives to assess the state of the wreck and see if something could be done to salvage it. A marker buoy was installed on May 30th. That's the wreck buoy that you see there on the left. And a lot of things were happening at the same time around the wreck. But uh, one of the things that um, happened, uh, which was really just a mere coincidence, and, and that uh, pretty much changed the rest of the history, was that um, the ship that you see in color there on the top, the uh, Navy, uh, the British Navy cruiser HMS Essex, was, and it's really a coincidence, was going to come up the St. Lawrence to Quebec City at that time. And when the Empress sank, she was pretty close to Father Point. And the HMS Essex had on board a team of expert divers and a lot of high tech equipment. They had, they were, um, they had um, uh, submarine telephones, uh, lamps, and um, very modern diving equipments. So just a coincidence, but a happy coincidence. And the British Admiralty was um, very happy to provide assistance. And they, um, they contacted the CPR and the uh, local Canadian authorities to uh, tell them that the divers would be made available to assist the Yankee Salvage Association, the private company to dive on the Empress. So the first few dives on the Empress were made um, June 8 and June 9 by both American and British divers. And the first few dives served only the purpose of assessing the state of the wreck, seeing how she was positioned on the bottom. And of course, even though um, most people in the know already knew that it was impossible to raise the wreck. Uh, they had to make sure that it was really impossible. So the first few dives uh, were made to try and see if it was ever possible to raise the Empress of Ireland. These first few dives convinced um, everybody participating, and especially William Wallace Wotherspoon, the uh, team leader of the Yankee Salvage Association. He was himself a diver, and he was also uh, an engineer. Um, so the first few dives convinced him that, of course, it was impossible to raise the Empress, but also it would be very difficult to, uh, to do a complete salvage operation on the Empress of Ireland because of the St. Lawrence River conditions. Um, there, were, there were strong currents. Visibility is really poor. The water, of course, is cold. And the wreck was lying on her starboard side at 100. And the bottom is 140 feet. So she was lying there, <clears throat> damaged. And being such a, a huge wreck, um, everything made it a very complicated and risky operation. So the operations had to be prepared thoroughly. And um, in early June, these two few dives only paved the way for the real preparation that would be coming. Part of the preparations was to make sure that two salvage boats were available for the whole dur duration of the operation. These are the two ships that you see there um, um, at the wharf in Rimouski. It's the um, powerful salvage tug 
uh, Lord Strathcona on the back there, and the salvage schooner Mary Marie Josephine, so Mary Josephine that you see in the forefront. And that's when the two first photos I found there uh, come in, because these pictures were taken on June 18, 1914, when the real preparation uh, was happening. They had to mark the wreck site with large buoys to moor the salvage ships. These are the large buoys that you see there being rolled on the wharf. And you can see on the bottom right there, the wreck site with the buoys installed to mark the diving operations. So that was June 18, the first few days. Now the operations could begin and uh, the dives uh, were happening all, all day long. Um, the, the complete, the total crew that was hired to do this was a little more than 25 people. Most of them uh, came up from New York City. Uh, part of the crew that you see there on the bottom left were uh, sand hogs that used to be working in the uh, New York subway tunnels and uh, tunnel construction in New York. They came up to Rimouski to spend the summer to assist as diver tenders and um, other uh, manual operations that had to be conducted for the salvage operation. <clears throat> so the first few days, June 18, 19, 20, the operations began. The main focus, of course, was to recover bodies. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, 1,012 people, people died on the Empress of Ireland. And in the first few days, um, including even during that night uh, of the sinking, almost, almost 200 bodies were already recovered. But that leaves uh, just a little more than 800 bodies still trapped in the wreck. And of course, the families of the victims wanted the bodies to be raised. So the first focus was to raise bodies of the victims. But also, if it was ever possible, the Yankee Salvage Association was hired to recover the purser's safe, uh, the uh, silver bullion that the Empress was um, transporting to England, and the mailbags. The, the mail at the time was a very important part of the cargo. On June 21st, 1914, um, the two salvage boats left uh, Rimouski early in the morning, went up to the wreck site and started diving. The conditions were not very good that day. So the first few dives uh, were made around 1 p.m. And one of the divers that went down was Edward Edgar Kassaboom, a Canadian actually, working for the American, uh, the Yankee Salvage Association Company, but he was originally from New Brunswick. And Kassaboom had died uh, the day before and two days before. And he was one of the first ones to, um, to dive June 21st. After... 30 minutes on the bottom, uh, the tender um, keeping the uh, keeping track of the movements of uh, Kassaboom on the bottom uh, noticed that the movements, movements had stopped and started to be uh, a bit worried about what happened to Kassaboom. So um, he alerted the, alerted the rest of the crew and uh, people on the surface on the Mary Josephine um, started to to uh, prepare to go down and see if Kassaboom was okay. So they sent the first diver down, couldn't find Kassaboom. Now we're an hour after the descent. And finally, um, it's Wilfred Whitehead, a diver from the HMS Essex, who went down, followed the path that Kassaboom had just followed, and found uh, Kassaboom's body lying on the bottom of the river. He brought Kassaboom back to the surface, and you can see on the photo there on the uh, upper right corner, a uh, decompression, decompression chamber that they had on the Marie Josephine. 
So he got Kasaboom up. They both went into the decompression chamber to try and uh, revive Kasaboom. But unfortunately, um, the Empress had claimed another life. And um, after the death of Kasaboom, um, a very black, a very dark cloud um, leaned over the whole operation. And very quickly, everybody realized that the, the preparations were good and uh, the equipment was good, but it was still not enough. And the Empress was really a hard uh, dive for them to uh, be conducting. So when Kasaboom died on June 21st, it was decided to go back to Quebec City, take a break and assess the situation. So everybody went back to Quebec City. And on June 23rd, um, William Wallace Wotherspoon, uh, the man that you see on the right there, the engineer and the team leader from the Yankee Salvage Association, testified at the Commission of Inquiry. And he testified that, um, according to him, it was almost impossible to do more to recover bodies. The operation was too risky. And for some time, June 23rd and 24th, uh, the whole operation was almost canceled. And it was decided that uh, if ever uh, divers would go back to the Empress, they would have to have better equipment and uh, change their uh, plan of operation a whole lot. On the HMS Essex, uh, after the death of Kasaboom, uh, it was decided that they had done enough, that the operation was too risky for them, and that at the end of the month, so just a few days after June 23rd, the, um, the British crew would have to go back to the Essex and continue their regular mission, leaving only the American divers on the wreck site. <clears throat> so after a few days of, of all of that happening, um, the Yankee Salvage Association approached the CPR again and the underwriters and the insurers to uh, sign formal contracts and tell them that, well, if you want us to continue the operations, we can do that, but we'll need better equipment and um, a definite commitment for, on, from you on your part that you're gonna pay what it costs, uh, what it costs to do this kind of salvage operation. So it was done and um, it was decided that the Yankee salvage would continue under these contracts and um, under the guidance of uh, the British um, uh, team leader, Officer McDarmid, William Wallace Wotherspoon ordered uh, from England, placed an order for uh, new equipment. And that's what you see there on these extraordinary photographs taken on July 2nd, 1914 on the Rimouski Pier, when the equipment that he had just ordered arrived um, from England on the Empress of Britain, actually, the sister ship of the Empress of Ireland. So what you see there is uh, what was considered uh, to be needed to continue the operation. So you can see uh, C.B. Gorman equipment, two brand new uh, helmets there with their shipping crates under them. You can see the um, uh, submarine telephone that was ordered at the same time. and. Um, the other photo that you see on the bottom right there show the brand new underwater lamps that they had order to continue the operations. So this is the team that was assembled then um, to dive the Empress. Um, the divers that you see there are Americans, Canadians, and um, they have all sorts of equipment and uh, they're assisted by the rest of the crew that you see there, tenders, engineers, um, deckhands, sailors, and the man uh, leading all of these operations is 
William Wallace Wotherspoon that you can see smiling on the left in the forefront there. Beginning um, early July, for safety reasons, it was it was decided that divers would go down only in pairs, so two at a time. And since they now had uh, that everybody now had uh, the communication systems, it was considered safer that way, and they could really start planning the operations to recover the safe, the mailbags, and the silver bullion. Of course, um, as I was mentioning, all through the summer of 1914, um, they continued to recover bodies, but because of the risk, uh, Wotherspoon prevented his team of divers from penetrating the wreck. So all the bodies that were recovered were found on the promenade decks and outside of the wreck. And um, all in all, they uh, recovered just a little more than 175 bodies uh, all through the summer. And most of them were unfortunately impossible to identify. Even just a few weeks after the sinking, uh, they were really badly decomposed. As for the, um, the salvage operations for the valuables, as I was mentioning, they had to be thoroughly planned and part of that planning was to study plans of the Empress of Ireland and to even make, uh, as you can see on the bottom photo there, a small 3D model made out of cardboard to study the path that would be followed from the side of the wreck through a hole that would have to be drilled with a pneumatic drill that you see there on the top. So the path that would have to be followed by divers down inside the wreck to the specie room where the safe was stored, the silver, silver bullion was stored, and uh, right next to where the uh, mail bags were also stowed. So you can imagine the amount of work and planning and the risk that was associated with such an operation. So all during the month of July, uh, divers went down to the wreck to prepare, to recover bodies all of the time, but also to prepare the drilling operation on the side of the wreck and uh, to prepare the, uh, uh, the penetration of the wreck to go down to the species room. They finally succeeded. Um, in mid-August, they, uh, they drilled the hole, uh, took out a large steel plate out of the side of the wreck, and um, got inside the Empress. And on August 19, 1914, the purser's safe was finally raised and brought to the surface on the Marie-Joséphine. And these are the extraordinary pictures of that very moment. You can see the water uh, pouring out of the safe that just uh, got out of the water there. Once the hole on the side of the wreck was drilled and the path was, uh, was um, uh, planned and had been followed for the safe, the rest of it, since it was all close together, the safe the silver bullion and the mailbags. The rest of it was a bit easier and went quite quickly. Already um, August 19, the, some silver bars uh, were brought up. And um, beginning of September, all of the 251 silver bars on the Empress of Ireland were brought to the surface. As you can see here on these photographs, um, that was an incredible trophy for the salvage team and everybody around them uh, posed with uh, the piles of silver bars on the deck of the Marie Josephine. On the left there are um, Captain Walsh of the CPR and uh, William Wallace Wotherspoon. In the center are two, unfortunately, 
uh, unidentified women <clears throat> uh, posing with a hand on, on, on a silver bar. And on the right there with the cap is uh, Mr. Uh, Ralph Stratton Blydenberg, who was a director of the Yankee Salvage Association and who happened to be the man who assembled the famous, the, the photo album I'm using now as a, uh, a source. So this photo is him and taken from his own photo album as a, uh, a souvenir of his uh, participation in the salvage operations on the Empress of Ireland. And finally, mid-September, 138 sacks of mail were brought up. And one by one, these letters, um, you see some examples there, but there's thousands of them. One by one, these letters were dried uh, in the uh, Ramuski post office and sent back to Ottawa to be treated and then sent back to the sender, not the recipient, but the sender of the letters. But before they were um, sent back, all of them were stamped with a very special stamp that collectors like nowadays. Um, actually, <clears throat> the one on the right there is part of my own collection. So they were all stamped uh, with recovered by divers on wreck of SS Empress of Ireland. So September 18, all of the work is completed and um, no one will visit this wreck again until it was rediscovered exactly 50 years later in 1964. So nowadays there is lots of ways that the, the Empress of Ireland, the, the forgotten Empress as we often say, uh, there's lots of ways that the Empress of Ireland is remembered. Um, there are monuments, plaques, markers, museum exhibits, lectures, as I'm doing now, books, documentaries to keep the memory of the ill-fated Empress of Ireland alive and um, to pay homage and tribute to the victims of this uh, somewhat forgotten disaster. And by being here with me today and listening to this presentation, you are also helping to keep this story alive. And for that, I thank you. Thanks a lot for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And I think there's a bit of time for, uh, for questions. Thank you so much, David. Can you hear me okay from here? Yeah, I can hear you okay. I'll, I'll stop okay. sharing my screen now if you... Sure. There you go. So I have some guests with me here in the library at the museum, and I do have some questions over Zoom as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start fielding uh, those questions. Uh, so this question uh, is from Sally. She is uh, one of our founders. He, she asks, was the person who had the album a family member of one of the divers? Yes, the uh, that's a good question. The, the album uh, had been kept in uh, Ralph Blydenberg's family, so one of the directors of the uh, salvage, uh, uh, the Yankee Salvage Association, for more than a hundred years, and um, what I didn't know at the time, uh, but I know now, is that when the album was dismantled and sold piece by piece uh, in 2021, it's because it had just been um, given away uh, at a flea market by a descendant of Mr. Blydenberg. So, uh, yeah, it just goes to show that sometimes um, one one family heirloom or treasure becomes some generations down uh, just another uh, old scrapbook in the basement. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it belonged to uh, to uh, a member of the family of uh, one of the directors of the diving company. I don't think Mr. Blydenberg ever dove the Empress, but he was... He was there as a, uh, a helping hand all through the summer of 1914 with the crew from New York City. There's another question. Yes. Are people diving the uh, wreck now? Yes. 
Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, and I saw also in the, I think it was in the chat, and I'll, I'll, I'll link the two questions together. Uh, somebody asked if there were any other salvage operations after the wreck was re rediscovered in 1964. Um, so yes, after the, the wreck was rediscovered in 1964, um, divers started um, to, to, to dive the wreck. Uh, it was a popular, even though it's a difficult dive, it, it became a really popular spot for wreck diving. And um, for decades, people could um, uh, bring up artifacts. And as long as they uh, declared the, uh, the artifacts to the receiver of wreck of Canada, uh, they could keep the artifacts afterwards. It was um, an open salvage wreck. Um, but this changed in um, the late 1990s when the Quebec government protected the wreck site in 1998, declaring it a uh, cultural property, and the government of Canada also. So the federal, the provincial, and the federal government declared the, the wreck site a protected site, government of Canada, a year later in 1999. And since then, people can still dive the wreck, but uh, they cannot recover artifacts. So it's been uh, 25 years now that uh, the wreck can can be visited by divers, but that the uh, the uh, the salvage of artifacts is forbidden. Was anything more done with the bodies that were on board? Um, no, no. So um, the that's another good question. The um, the bodies that were recovered at the time. So in total, that's almost uh, almost four hundred because two hundred the night of the sinking, and then almost two hundred by the divers. Um, when they were identified, they, they were sent back to their uh, families if they could pay for the transportation. Uh, or they were buried in Rimouski. Uh, there are two burial sites in Rimouski, and some of them are in Quebec City also. But the, uh, the ones near the wreck are the ones in Rimouski. There's one along the, uh, the shore of the St. Lawrence and one in the Catholic Cemetery. And the unidentified uh, victims are all buried there. And um, after the salvage operations of 1914, I'm not aware of any other bodies that was uh, recovered. I know that some divers, uh, un unfortunately and and uh, and uh, and very probably unknowingly, brought up um, uh, human remains over the years. But these, as far as I know, were all uh, afterwards buried in the uh, the cemetery in Father Point uh, for the, the unidentified victims. Uh, this is actually a question I myself had. Um, so you said during the collision uh, with the store said that the two ships could not communicate with each other. I was wondering why that was because we do know that they did have, you know, wireless, uh, you know, radio at that time. So why could the two ships not communicate their positions to one another? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, the, the wireless at the time uh, was not commonly used uh, for this purpose. Uh, back in 1914, after the sinking of the Titanic, as you know, uh, it was instituted that uh, steamships had to have um, Marconi wireless apparatus on board, but it was still not uh, compulsory to have, um, for all the steamships, to have 24-hour watches for Marconi operators. And, um, and it was not common to use that to communicate from ship to ship for um, quick um, navigation decisions and uh, route planning or anything like that. It was not from bridge to bridge, the um, Marconi uh, apparatus was not used at the time. Okay, this is another one uh, from the Zoom. This one is from Jan. Uh, she asks, first of all, she says that was a great talk and thank you. And she asks, what kind of decompression technology was available at that time? Mm. Um, I don't know if I can go back to the picture I I had, but they had, um, if you remember earlier in the presentation, I showed uh, 
a picture of the uh, decompression chamber that they had on the uh, Marie Josephine. That was a huge, a huge uh, uh, apparatus. It was 15 feet long and just a little over five feet uh, in diameter. And as far as I was able to gather from the research that I've done, <clears throat> and actually this uh, specific mention comes from Robert Owen King, who was a consulting engineer uh, for this operation in 1914. In his autobiography, uh, Robert Owen King said that this was the first time in the world, and if somebody online knows uh, uh, differently, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know. But according to Robert Owen King, this was the first time in the world that such a decompression chamber was used on uh, a salvage boat over the wreck. So on the theater of operations on a wreck site like this. So this, uh, this was um, uh, the technolo technology that they used um, at the time. And this is how they, uh, they did the, the, the decompression uh, on the Marie Josephine all through the, the summer of 1914 using that decompression chamber. Uh, this is another one from our founder, Dr. Sally Bauer. She says, I have been to the original museum in Rumiski. Tell us about the new museum. Is it at the same location? Oh, yes. Yes, it is at the same location, just at the, the, the base of the uh, Father Point lighthouse that you saw in some of the pictures there. So that's, that's actually just a few miles uh, from the wreck site. And uh, the museum, I'm actually... Uh, Full, full disclosure here, I'm actually a member of the, the board of directors of uh, the uh, the Empress of Island Museum there in Rimouski, even though I'm based in Montreal. I'm a, I'm a member of the, the, the uh, board of directors there. And um, the museum has been uh, expanded a few times. And, um, and uh, now it's, uh, it's the only permanent exhibit on the Empress of Island available worldwide. And uh, I invite you to uh, to visit again, if you uh, if you can, you're welcome to uh, come to the museum. And and actually, I might just mention this also. If if um, anybody is around uh, the Rimouski area around the uh, the time of the sinking, uh, will be will be um, uh, doing a special event this year for the 110th anniversary of the sinking um, on the weekend of June. I think it's June 1st and 2nd this year. So uh, we'll be doing a special tour of the Rimouski area for all the Empress of Ireland related sites. And the uh, the access to the museum will be free. And there's a lot of exciting things happening to uh, the uh, the Salvation Army band will be there. And uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of exciting things uh, um, happening for the 110th anniversary this year. Uh, another David in the chat asks, are there any underwater photos of the wreck? Um, modern ones, the modern ones, yes, there are. Um, film footage and underwater photos. The visibility is always, well, always, not always, but it is often really poor on the Empress of Ireland. So it's hard to, uh, to have a, a view of a large area of the wreck. But there are underwater photos that were taken. Yes, um, at the time, no. Um, when I when I uh, was expecting the album, um, when I when I bought that album, I didn't know what what to expect. I knew that there was a lot of photos of the salvage operations, and the technology existed. It was rare, but the technology existed at the time to take underwater photos. So I I I kind of wished that there was a a, a among the 56 photos uh, of 1914 that one of them would be an underwater photo but there was none so i don't know if any underwater uh wreck photos of the empress uh before 1964. Uh, this is another question from our guests here in the library uh they asked what was the water temperature at depth like mm. It's not much difference uh, different from uh, uh, the surface. Um, 
and uh, it's around, it's always around three, four, five degrees Celsius in that area in the St. Lawrence River. So it's, it's, it's really cold. And one thing that you might have noticed uh, on the photographs that I showed, um, British divers were diving barehanded and the American divers had rubber gloves. And it may seem very trivial now, but uh, at the time it was, uh, it was, uh, it, 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 it was a, a great exchange of technologies. And, um, and some articles that I found at the time were especially um, focusing on this, that uh, the Americans were, <clears throat> the Americans were impressed with some of the British techniques, uh, but that the, uh, the British divers were uh, quite happy to have the uh, rubber gloves that the Americans were using to dive the Empress. Okay, another question. Uh, this one says, at sea, ships typically pass port to port. So why did the uh, two ships in this incident decide to do starboard to starboard? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it was also mentioned in the Commission of Inquiry that the the uh, usual um, uh, route would have been port to port. That's true. There's a, uh, There was at the time uh, an exception to that rule and, and the exception was created because of the approach to the pilot station. Um, approaching the pilot stations, um, the the ships all had to leave the main uh, the main uh, sailing route. And approaching the station, of course, they would they could pass from starboard to starboard or port to port, and uh, and they they just uh, they just followed the the main route up till there, but approaching the station, this was an, an exception uh, to the uh, standard procedure. Okay, I have a couple more questions from the Zoom. Uh, I will give you a chance to talk a little bit about your books at the end, uh, because I did get a question of are your books available in English? Um, so at the end, if you want to talk a little bit about your books um, after the Q&A. Uh, another question was, does the Salvation Army have a special tribute site to the victims? Oh, yes. Um, in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto, uh, the Salvation Army erected a very large monument paying homage to uh, the victims of the, the sinking that belong to the Salvation Army. I did not mention that in the presentation, but out of the uh, 161 Salvation Army members on board the Empress that night, um, almost, uh, well, only, uh, if I remember correctly, only 27 survived. And uh, their whole uh, Canadian staff band was on board, 30, 39 members, if I remember correctly, and only a few survived. So. It was absolutely devastating for the Canadian Salvation Army. And um, up to this day, they still commemorate the sinking. And um, they're the main the main place where they do that is uh, the monument at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. And actually, I it's 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 uh, it's an interesting question, especially this year because of the hundred and tenth anniversary. Um, and I was just actually speaking to. Uh, the uh, Canadian Salvation Army uh, official historian earlier today, and he was telling me that he's coming to Rimouski um, for the events of the 110th anniversary. <clears throat> but the weekend before, the Salvation Army will be doing a, uh, a ceremony at the uh, Mount Pleasant Cemetery. <clears throat> Okay, I have one more question from the Zoom. This one's from Brian. He asks, are you familiar with the story of the engine room crew member who survived both the Empress and the Titanic sinking? Yes, and it's a true story. Um, and uh, not to uh, toot my own horn here, but uh, it's uh, it, it, was, it was known that a crew member had survived the Titanic and the Empress, but in my first book, um, the one from 2016, I'm, I'm showing in the back there because my Empress books are there. Um, I actually proved that this was true using his signature. 
So that crew member was uh, William Clark, and he was a uh, a stoker, a fireman. So you know the the, the people that uh, shoveled coal in the furnaces and the boilers, and he was on watch both. Uh, during the uh, sinking of the, uh, the, the collision uh, of the Titanic and the sinking of the Titanic and during the uh, collision with the stores dad on board the Empress of Ireland. And he survived both sinkings. <clears throat> he was the, the only person who could actually compare the two tragedies. And uh, he is uh, famously known and he's often quoted for saying that the uh, Titanic sank like a baby going to sleep and the empress of Ireland sank like um, a hog rolling over in a ditch so it's uh it's a, a an illustration of uh, how the sinkings happened and if you if you wonder why uh, a man so low in the uh, the ship's uh, uh pecking order and so low in the ship physically being in the boiler rooms could survive um, such horrific uh, tragedies. Well, you have to know that because the boiler rooms were so terribly hot and not well ventilated, the um, these ships were designed with a direct access to fresh air for the firemen. From the boiler rooms, they could um, uh, climb up a series of ladders and end up directly on the boat deck. So. It was actually not such a bad position to be in if you were on watch in a boiler room because you were the first uh, people to know that something really bad was happening and you had a direct access to the, the lifeboats on top of the ship. Wow, I never even knew that. That is a very interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, this is probably going to be our last question. Uh, this one's from Luis. He asks, uh, the picture album must have other interesting salvaging pictures not related to the Empress. Are you sharing them somewhere that we can see them? Yes, absolutely. It has a lot of interesting pictures. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it would be of interest to a lot of people out here. Um, for now, I've only I've only uh, been able to uh, to write another article related and based on the album related to other salvage operations, and it's actually it's actually uh, uh, about the salvage of the Yankee, because the uh, the company was called the Yankee Salvage Association because it was formed um, to uh, salvage the USS Yankee which was a, uh, a gunboat, a training uh, gunboat of the uh, U.S. Navy in 1908. Um, and um, I, I wrote a short article talking about the Yankee, but the rest of the 500 and some photos in the album uh, will be used uh, later on down the line uh, while I pursue other uh, research interests. But um, but yes, it's my goal that the uh, uh, the, the 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 best photos in there will be uh, made publicly available because I think I think they're interesting and uh, everybody will will enjoy seeing them. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let you talk a little bit. I know you did before, but if you wanted to talk a little bit about your books um, related to the Empress, um, just so people know where to find them um, if they'd like to do some further reading. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'll, I'll start off by saying um, uh, the, the the main question was, uh, are they available in English? And unfortunately, I have to say not for now. Unfortunately, they both were published in French first. Uh, and uh, as far as the, the one from 2016 goes, uh, there's no English translation um, uh, planned in the short term. But the other one um, about the salvage operations is translated and um, I'm hoping should be available in English in the uh, coming months. So um, for now, they're only available in French and I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the publisher is uh, GID, so GID in Quebec. 
and um, uh, and uh, they can be ordered directly from the publisher. Um, but uh, but as soon as the English version is available, I can uh, I can inform the uh, the great team at the the diving museum and uh, and uh, maybe it, it it might be available through the museum sometime in the future. I really hope and plan that the uh, English version will be available soon. Okay, well, thank you so much, David. Um, that was really fascinating. I'm really happy that you were able to join us tonight. Um, if anyone watching has any further questions for David, this whole video is going to go on YouTube and you can leave a comment there um, and I'll be sure to reach out to David so that he can answer them. Um, but thank you everyone who joined over Zoom, who are guests in the library and thank you again, David. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, for having me. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening, everyone.